Hey, let's get started for real this time. Sorry about that, folks. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for joining tonight. My name is the Reverend Nathan Ipsel. I am the Executive Director of Faithful America, as well as an Episcopal priest. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Faithful America webinar. This is the first in a series of three Linton webinars. The series is called Giving Up White Supremacy. And tonight's first part is called The White in White Christian Nationalism. Now, before we go any further, I want to say that on a tough topic like racism and white supremacy, it's easy to point fingers. But as Jesus reminded us, we need to take the log out of our own eye before talking about the speck in someone else's. Now, we're all one body of Christ, Christian nationalism, white evangelicalism, that's part of our eye as the body of Christ. But we're going to look at the log in our own eye, too, in our own progressive communities, Part two of this series will be called The Logs in Our Own Eyes, Removing the Log from Our Own Eyes, and we'll talk about racism in our own progressive communities and in mainline Protestant and Catholic churches. We're still getting that scheduled, but we'll have details soon. Keep an eye on your inbox. But we start the series tonight, I think appropriately, with a look at the white in white Christian nationalism, because white Christian nationalism is the biggest threat to democracy and freedom, but also to the church. So let's dig in. Our guests tonight, we'll meet in just a moment. We're delighted to have them are Dr. Jamar Tisby and the Reverend Dr. Randall Balmer. Faithful America is the largest online community of grassroots Christians working to put our faith into action for love and social justice while also reclaiming Christianity from the religious right and from white Christian nationalism. That last piece, fighting Christian nationalism, is such a big part of our work. But we use two different terms quite frequently, Christian nationalism and white Christian nationalism. What's the difference between these two terms? Are they the same thing? It's one of the questions we get asked almost the most. Yes, they're basically the same thing. Sometimes I say that white Christian nationalism is the biggest subset of Christian nationalism. Our friends at the group Christians Against Christian Nationalism say that Christian nationalism gives cover to and helps propagate white supremacy. Ultimately, Chris, we use both terms depending on the context, but they are the same. And even when we say just Christian nationalism, not white Christian nationalism, it's vital that we still point out the racism inherent to Christian nationalism in the American context. So if you want to learn more about Christian nationalism and white Christian nationalism in terms of what they are, the definitions, I'm going to give a very brief definition before turning to Dr. Tisby, but you can also go to faithfulamerica.org and in the upper right corner, click on the phrase Christian nationalism and see a great FAQ and a toolkit of further resources and other webinars and curricula you can use. I think my colleague Carly might be putting the link to that in the chat soon as well. So Christian nationalism is basically the political ideology that says America is and should be a Christian nation. It, it merges the identities of the, the civic identity, the patriotic identity, the American identity, and the religious identity to basically say, you're not a good American unless you're a good Christian. What happened to the separation of church and state? Well, Christian nationalism explicitly rejects the church, separation of church and state, says there is no such thing. And its goal is not to follow the teachings of Jesus, but to use us versus them tactics to seize power for its adherents and those don't like them, and those who are like them. Now, that might not seem racist. What's racist about having a Christian nation? Well, it, it certainly seems anti-Semitic, uh, Islamophobic, anti-Muslim, but in the U.S. context, it is also racist. It is white, because those us versus them tactics that Christian nationalism uses to seize power, look at who's grabbing the power, who they're grabbing it for. It's the white evangelical, the conservative white evangelical movement. And look at the ways that they use race as they try to seize power. Look at the practical impacts. First of all, on January 6th, whose votes were they trying to overturn in Jesus's name in that insurrection? Predominantly black and brown voters in major cities. What legislation does Christian nationalism seek to pass? Often it's targeting or scapegoating race through things like attacks on critical race theory in schools, scapegoating black people. We'll hear from Dr. Balmer about the history of white evangelicalism and the religious right in this country and how it's actually rooted in trying to defend segregation. 
And above all, look at the basic identity of white Christian nationalism. There's no such thing as a Christian nation because what Christianity are you talking about? So many different denominations, so many different theologies, and the specific theologies of evangelical dominionism that white Christian nationalism propagates and roots itself in are culturally white. They have nothing to do with what you see in many black church traditions. They basically claim to represent all Christianity, erasing many, most black Christian voices with a cumulative effect of racism, white supremacy. So even when we focus on the patriarchy of Christian nationalism, the, uh, the, the political violence, the, separation, the attack on the separation of church and state, the anti-Semitism, it is still ultimately rooted in whiteness in the American context. So if we don't want to distract from a patriarchal conversation, maybe we'll say it's Christian nationalism instead of saying white Christian nationalism. But even then, we still need to point out that it is rooted in white supremacy, that it spreads white supremacy. No matter what name we use, Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism, Christo-fascism, we can never separate out the white supremacy. We always need to acknowledge it. And who better to discuss that white supremacy, to acknowledge it, to explain its roots and its terrible impact on the church and on democracy than our two speakers tonight, Dr. Jamar Tisby and the Reverend Dr. Randall Balmer. We'll hear from both. They'll ask each other questions. I'll ask them questions. And then we'll turn to your questions. Please use the Q&A doobly-doo down at the bottom of your screen. We'll take questions through that little feature. Uh, and, and my colleague Carly and I will read through them uh, at the end of the evening and, and ask many of them. Unfortunately, we probably won't have time to get to all of them, but we'll ask as many as we can of Jamar and Randall. So our first speaker tonight is Dr. Jamar Tisby, who I will invite to come back on camera. Dr. Jamar Tisby, a friend of Faithful America, it's been a year and a half since we had him on a webinar. We're thrilled he's back. Uh, last time we were uh, going rounds with Tony Perkins, so maybe we'll talk about Tony Perkins. <laughs> I remember it. Jamar is a New York Times bestselling author, national speaker, and public historian of race and religion on a mission to deliver truths from the Black experience with depth and clarity. A leading expert on white Christian nationalism, he is the co-founder and president of The Witness, a Black Christian collective, and the author of How to Fight Racism, Courageous Christianity and the Journey Toward Racial Justice, as well as The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism. Carly will share uh, links to Bookshop where you can buy these books. Faithful America will get a cut, so will independent booksellers rather than big billionaires if you shop at Bookshop. Jamar also has multiple podcasts like Pass the Mic and his Substack column, uh, Footnotes. And you can see him in the new Rob Reiner produced documentary, God and Country, about white Christian nationalism and January 6th. He is, I'm almost done, I promise, professor of history at Simmons College in Kentucky, a historically black college. And you should also pre-order his new book, The Spirit of Justice, Faith, Race, and Resistance, or check out really cool swag at justicetakesides.org. I could keep going, but you want to hear from him, not about him. Jamar, thank you so much. That was a great introduction. You, you hit all the right notes. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a Monday night um, to talk about this very light topic, <laughs> white Christian nationalism, and what makes it white. Well, let me begin with a story from my own experience. So I didn't grow up Christian. I became a Christian in high school through the ministry of a white evangelical youth group filled with just really well-meaning, kind folks. And I sort of stayed in that vein in terms of my religious experience, also drifting into sort of conservative, reformed, and evangelical circles as well. All of that to say, I went to several predominantly white evangelical churches, and the most recent was uh, during the 2020 presidential election. I actually was serving as interim pastor of a church in the Mississippi Delta on the Arkansas side, very small uh, white evangelical church that my family and I had been attached to for several years. During that election cycle and then subsequent months into 2021, we underwent what I would call a church split, primarily over issues of Christian nationalism. 
I remember very clearly there, there were two issues uh, that they called a church meeting for, um, and one of them was about wearing masks during the pandemic. Uh, they didn't want to. Some of the church didn't want to. And the other issue was politics. And the specific accusation was that the way that uh, I talked about politics made the person feel bad for being a Republican. Mind you, I had not spoken or preached on voting for any party. I spoke about things like truth and integrity, and this person felt accused and attacked. After that, uh, they, their families, and a few others stopped coming. It was a very small church, so it made a big difference. And I was thankful at that point that I at least had this label, this framework, this nomenclature called white Christian nationalism to know what was going on. Because the reality is a lot of us have experienced those kinds of things in our churches, especially in the past eight or so years. Um, but at the beginning, say around 2015, 2016, I didn't have that language. And I didn't really know how to describe what was happening, what I was seeing from friends, from pastors, from mentors who were diving headlong into this sort of political uh, ideology, almost, um, you would say, idolatry in a sense, and completely betraying the values it seems that they had espoused. Now, we know a lot more about this, and we've named it, and we've talked about it since then, um, but uh, that was some of my personal experience. And as I dove into it and got more interested in learning about white Christian nationalism because of what I was experiencing, because of what I was seeing in the church, it became very clear just how salient race was in these, in these phenomena. So let me first pause and give my definition. Reverend Nathan gave a very helpful definition, and I think it takes a constellation of definitions to really start to wrap our heads around what white Christian nationalism actually is, which is also funny because you'll see a lot of people who, who don't think white Christian nationalism is a thing. They're usually folks on the far right. One of the first accusations is nobody defines it. Actually, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> you'll hear two definitions uh, just tonight. So here's here's the definition that, that I tend to use. And I say, um, first of all, uh, echoing Reverend Nathan, I often say white Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to democracy and the witness of the church in the United States today. The greatest threat to democracy because it seeks to have this authoritarian power uh, that defies the will of the people. And then also it's a great threat. It's the greatest threat to the witness of the church today because of the way it's repelling people from Jesus. It's 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 causing folks to run away from the church because they look at white Christian nationalism, they think that's what Christianity is about, and they want nothing to do with it, quite understandably. So what is it? White Christian nationalism is an ethno-cultural ideology that uses Christian symbolism to create a permission structure for the acquisition of political power and social control. We'll drop that in the chat. White Christian nationalism's ethno-cultural ideology that uses Christian symbolism to create a permission structure for the acquisition of political power and social control. Let me break that down briefly, as and then we'll delve into the white part of white Christian nationalism. So first of all, I say it's ethno-cultural, which is really the heart of what I'm talking about today, because it's at, its adherents view European and Western civilization as supreme as better than, say, cultures coming out of Eastern, Southern contexts, wherever the majority of people are not white. And they'll use that language of European or Western civilization, but it's racially coded language. In the United States, it often translates into notions of whiteness and white supremacy. We'll talk more about that. And by the way, yes, Black people and other people of color can participate in this, because white Christian nationalism is a set of ideas that if you ascribe to them, you can have provisional acceptance in the group. And as a matter of fact, be strategically deployed as a colorful face 
to deflect accusations of racism, but really the ideology is still there. So that's ethnocultural, but it's an ideology because it's based on a set of ideas and assumptions that have more to do with prejudice and opinion than data or evidence. Have you ever tried to talk to someone who's like deep down the rabbit hole of white Christian nationalism? It doesn't matter how many facts, statistics, books, articles you put in front of them. It's you're not getting anywhere. Why? Because this is more than just about a, a logical set of coherent beliefs. It's about it's about an ideology. It's about identity. It's about belonging. There's more at stake here than just an intellectual assent to some principles. Uh, so there's an emotional identity attachment here that makes it more of an ideology. Oftentimes, people will, will put the word right, Christian nationalism in quotes, or I'll often get a comment online or something that says, there's nothing Christian about it. Well, of course, it's not Christian in the sense that it doesn't resemble Jesus, but it is Christian in the sense that it does use Christianity. It uses Christian symbols like crosses. It uses the Christian sacred text, the Bible. It uses prayer. There were prayers at the January 6th insurrection said in Jesus' name. And so, and these folks are in our churches. So it is Christian in the sense that if we ourselves call call ourselves Christian, then we have to deal with other people calling themselves Christian too, but doing these things in the name of God. And that is what I think um, is one of the biggest uh, evils of white Christian nationalism is it's a violation of the third commandment, certainly of the first two, but also of the third that says, uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain, which doesn't mean saying a cuss word, it means doing things in God's name that God would never condone. And that's what's happening with white Christian nationalism. But we have to deal with it as if these folks genuinely believe they're Christians, as if they're in our churches, because in many cases they are, um, or at least they're using the Christian name. But the, also the question comes, not just is white Christian nationalism Christian, but who's Christianity? That's key when we're talking about the racial component because you have different expressions of Christianity, especially when Christianity is coming from people on the margins and in the United States, especially when you have black Christians in the conversation. It looks very different. Even political engagement from the standpoint of faith and politics looks very different depending on whose Christianity you're talking about. So we're almost done <laughs> with that definition. I just want to talk a little bit about permission structure. So again, why even use the name Christianity? Because it gives a divine permission to what they're doing and what they're about. They see it as a holy mission, almost a crusade, if you will. And then what are they truly about? Political power and social control political power. They want to use the levers of democracy to get into office. Now there's gerrymandering, there's voter suppression, all of those things. And then once they get into the office, they'll change the rules so that they can stay in office no matter what the will of the people is. So that's what we're dealing with when, when we're talking about political power. And that's why it's a threat to democracy. But also, it's a form of social control. And this is very important because this is where race comes into it. Race is a way of organizing society unjustly, but a way of ordering society nevertheless. So we're dealing with an ethnocultural ideology that uses Christian symbolism to create a permission structure for the acquisition of political power and social control. So let's just let's talk a little bit more about the white in white Christian nationalism. Uh, Reverend Nathan referenced this and said, you know, sometimes people don't say the white part out loud. I almost always do. I think there are at least three reasons why people would not use the white in white Christian nationalism. Um, one is ignorance. They don't know. Maybe they've heard the, the phrase Christian nationalism. Maybe they've never heard of Christian nationalism, but when they hear it, they, they haven't heard the white part and they just don't know or don't know why it's important to use. That could be. 
Another reason is avoidance. So they want to deny that race has anything to do with what we're calling white Christian nationalism. I see this especially on the part of extreme white Christian nationalists who don't mind the Christian part. They don't mind the nationalism part because in their mind, nationalism means patriotism. That's not what we're saying nationalism means, right? So they don't want to act as if race has anything to do with their version of religion or politics, but it does, even if they won't admit it. So there's avoidance there. And then the other reason is perhaps optics or evangelism. Uh, this is part of the reason why in that film, uh, God and Country, the documentary that just came out, uh, oftentimes they'll talk about Christian nationalism because not that they're trying to avoid it per se, but because it's an automatic conversation stopper. <laughs> if you have some folks who are skeptical or questioning white Christian nationalism, you want to have a conversation about it. If you put that race part in there, it's going to be a wall. Now, I'm not saying I always agree with that. I'm just saying that maybe these are some reasons people don't say the white part out loud. But I do. I'm going to say the white part out loud. And here's why. There is a social structure that is implicit and sometimes made explicit in white Christian nationalism. There's a social structure in white Christian nationalism. And I don't think it's going too far to say that that social structure is not that dissimilar from the way plantations were organized. That social structure is not that dissimilar from the way plantations were organized. What do I mean? How was a plantation organized? You had a wealthy white male who was the head of the plantation. And it was always that way. And then that wealthy white male was sort of the patriarch of the entire plantation family, if you will, family in quotes. First of all, for his immediate family, so his white wife and their children, and then for the so-called extended pseudo family, which included enslaved people, but as perpetual children, never on an equal status, to the point where oftentimes a white plantation owner would rape black women and enslave his own children. So it was never on an equal basis if they had, is that one drop rule, a one drop of uh, African blood in them, uh, disqualified them from a certain level of equality. But you can see that from this structure flow a whole lot of other things like patriarchy and sexism and women can't have equal power. And of course, black people can't have equal power or anyone uh, considered part of the laboring class and poorer, right? So there is a way society that white Christian nationalists want society structured, even if they won't say it out loud. Um, it's also interesting that when you go back and you look at the Civil War period, there are a lot of Southerners who will say, essentially, well, you know, things were just fine here. Society was orderly. Everyone knew their place until these Northern carpetbaggers came around, until these uppity Negroes got these highfalutin ideas about freedom and equality. Everything was in its place. And I think there's some reminiscent, reminiscent of that in, in this idea of MAGA, make America great again. I think implicit in that idea is make it, make society an ordered hierarchy like it used to be before. Make sure everyone knows their place. And oh, it just happens that wealthy white men tend to be on top in that society. Now we just dove right in here, y'all. Uh, I, I I don't know anything about you through this screen, so do not throw rocks at your computer. Um, I'm just saying that there's a a racial component here. Sometimes it's more explicit and in your face. Sometimes it's implicit. But we got to look at how 
this plays out in terms of how people are ordering society. And I'll wrap up here soon because we have to hear from Dr. Balmer. I want to touch a little bit on the, the way that Christianity has been complicit in reinforcing this racist structure of society. So we can go all the way back to things like the so-called curse of Ham, which said if African people are descendants of Ham and Ham was forever cursed to, to be a slave of his brothers, then that's justification for race-based chattel slavery. Now, there's all kinds of theological uh, twisting going on there, but that's one of the ways they justified the enslavement and the structure uh, of this society along racial lines. It, it also twists church authority. So we can go all the way back to 1452 and the papal bull, Dumb Diversus, from Pope Nicholas V. We read all about this in Mark Charles and Sung Chan Ra's book, Unsettling Truths. And basically from the Pope himself, said that if Europeans went out and discovered, quote unquote, new lands, then they could rightly be taken over and enslave the people they found because those people were pagans. So right away, this sets up this assumption that civilized, powerful means Christian, means European. And in the colonial era in the United States, it shaped uh, the ideas that to be Christian was to be white. To be American was to be white, right? We can go on and on. Twisted baptism in 1667, the Virginia Assembly said baptism would not emancipate you if you were a person of color, Native American, mixed race, or African descent. And then it, they twisted fellowship. So churches were often segregated. God's household and people treated as second-class citizens. This, by the way, is what led to the growth of historically Black denominations. One of the things I say in my first book, The Color of Compromise, there would be no Black church without racism in the white church. It wasn't due to these deep theological or biblical differences in a lot of cases that there was a separation. It's Black people didn't want to be treated like second-class citizens in the household of God. And we can go on and on, but I want to give you a quote from William J. Simmons, who was the leader of the Ku Klux Klan in the Jim Crow era. And I don't want to draw a straight line, but there are some similarities here. So this is from a New York Times article where he's writing in response to another column, and he describes his vision of the Klan. And this is 1922. William J. Simmons wrote this. The Ku Klux Klan admits membership to none but native-born, white, Gentile, Protestant Americans, and here's the nationalism part, whose statement of principles was a restoration of the fundamental principles of American democracy as embodied in the Constitution of the United States, an organization whose code of conduct was Christianity. Fundamental to white Christian nationalism is the idea that the United States was founded as a Christian nation, and it's under threat to the degree it does not adhere to a fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity. And this William J. Simmons, leader of the Klan right here, is saying that an organization whose code of conduct was Christianity, but he's also saying who counts, who can be included, native born, not immigrants, white European, not from anywhere else, not brown-skinned folks or black folks, Gentile. There's the anti-Semitism here. Protestant, there was a big anti-Catholic sentiment then, but I think a difference between then and now, 100 years later, is it includes Catholics, white Christian nationalism can. So we see the identity here. We see the social hierarchy here. And one quote from... Uh, Gorski and Perry's book on white Christian nationalism. They say the United States cannot be both a truly multiracial democracy, a people of people, and a nation of nations, and a white Christian nation at the same time. So when we say white Christian nationalism, whether you say the white part out loud or not, understand that it's always there. It's always present. 
And it's always driving and moving and seeking to create a particular social order that keeps people of different races in their place and subordinate to one particular group of people. Much more to say on that, but that's at least an introduction. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Jamar Tisby, for saying the white part out loud. That, that's exactly what we need. Um, I, I love hearing you dismantle the permission structure and, and you talk about just how pervasive this is. Thank you so much. And uh, I, great points about the KKK because that sets us up for another very important historical lesson. We turn, so let, let me make a couple of housekeeping points first. I see a number of, uh, before we turn to Dr. Balmer, a number of people have asked in the in the questions about um, having trouble clicking on or copying the links from our chat section. We'll look into those settings for our next webinar, but we are going to send out all of the links uh, in an email to everyone who attended probably tomorrow. And yes, we'll also send out a link to the recording. Uh, we're having trouble live streaming on Facebook like we would usually do, but we will upload a recording of this webinar to both Facebook and YouTube late tonight or tomorrow, and we will send that recording to you. So yes, you'll be able to view this again later, maybe with friends from church. Wouldn't that be great for Lent? Uh, and uh, so I think, oh, and if you have questions, um, a question just came in from Carol asking the name of the docu documentary film that uh, Dr. Tisby just referenced, and that, that's God and Country. It's produced by Rob Reiner. Uh, just Google God and Country documentary film. You'll find the website. Where can it be viewed? Check the website. It's, it's in select screenings and theaters now, um, hopefully one near you. And now we turn to our next speaker. Oh, I keep trying to say, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box, put them in, in for Jamar now while they're fresh in your mind. And after we hear from Randall Bomber, we'll ask questions of both. And we turn to Dr. Randall Balmer. Dr. Balmer is a prize-winning historian, Emmy nominee, Episcopal priest, and the John Phillips Chair of Religion at the greatest university in the world, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. He is the author of more than a dozen books, including Bad Faith, Race and the Rise of the Religious Right. If you've heard news stories about how the religious right was originally started not to ban abortion, but to protect segregation at private schools like Jerry Falwell's Liberty, they were probably quoting or interviewing Dr. Balmer. Dr. Balmer publishes widely in both scholarly journals and in the popular press, and has appeared frequently on network television, NPR, and with both Stephen Colbert and Jon Stewart, who's back now. His other books also include Redeemer, The Life of Jimmy Carter, God in the White House, How Faith Shaped the Presidency from John F. Kennedy to George W. Bush, an important text for me in grad school, and Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, A Journey into the Evangelical Subculture in America, an important text for me in undergrad, which was made into a three-part documentary for PBS. He has also taught at Princeton, Yale Divinity, Northwestern, and Emory Universities, hosted documentaries about creationism and Billy Graham, and lectured globally in Austria and Lebanon. Dr. Balmer, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You are muted. My pleasure, Nathan. Glad to be here, and I'm glad to meet Dr. Tisby uh, in this uh, in this occasion. I think you wanted me to talk a little bit about Christian nationalism from a, more of a historical perspective. Not to say that Dr. Tisby did not; I'm not suggesting that at all. But I think it's important to nail down the history a little bit. I, I like to say that Christian nationalism, this notion that the United States is and always has been a Christian nation really falters on two grounds, heresy and history. Heresy, uh, these, the, the people promoting, or many of the people promoting Christian nationalism claim to be biblical literalists. The Bible is their foundation for faith. Their Bible is their basis for understanding how they should act in the world. But didn't Jesus say in the Gospel of John, my kingdom is not of this world? It would seem to me that quote would have something to do or something to say about the whole issue of Christian nationalism. Now, I'm not a theologian, but it seems to me on the face of it, that's relevant to this conversation. And now let's look at the history. There's no quarrel about 
the fact that the Puritans were among the earliest settlers, European settlers or English settlers in America, sought to create a theocracy in New England, particularly in Massachusetts. Uh, that didn't go well for them for all sorts of reasons. And one of the dissidents was Roger Williams, who was originally a Puritan, but who ran afoul of the Puritan authorities because he feared too close a relationship between church and state. Roger Williams was expelled from the colony uh, of uh, Massachusetts. He went to Rhode Island and established there a place of religious toleration where all religions were welcome and, and tolerated. In 18, sorry, 1644, he wrote a, a very important treatise in which he talked about the importance of separating the garden of the church from the wilderness of the world by means of a wall of separation. And this is the metaphor that uh, gets used when we talk about the configuration of church and state in American life. If you think carefully about that statement, it's become so familiar that I think we've lost sight of its importance. And that is to say that Roger Williams and his contemporaries were not members of the Sierra Club. They did not share our romance with wilderness. So when Roger Williams talks about segregating the garden of the church from the wilderness of the world, what he's saying is that we need to protect the integrity of the faith from too close an association with the state. Now, I'm going to skip ahead several centuries and then before I go back to my historical narrative. Some of you remember that in the summer of, 19, of, of 2001, Judge Roy Moore, the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, installed a granite monument in the lobby of the Judicial Building in Montgomery, about the size of a washing machine. And on that monument were etched the Ten Commandments. Now, Moore also stipulated that no other re religious representations would be allowed in that space. Uh, he, also, he also rejected the appeal from the Alabama Humanist Association, both members, no doubt. Uh, and he said, no, no other representations, just the Ten Commandments. Well, I happen to be one of the uh, expert witnesses in that Alabama Ten Commandments case. And my testimony in part was that the First Amendment is the best friend that religion has ever had. That is to say, the First Amendment established a free marketplace for religion in American life. And that meant that there was competition in that marketplace. And I'm a, I'm a professor of a, a student of American religious history, and I can tell you that there are all sorts of religious groups in America precisely because of the First Amendment, precisely because of this competition that was engendered by the First Amendment. So religion, uh, the First Amendment is the best friend that religion has ever had. When Judge Thompson ruled correctly that the monument represented a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment and ordered its removal, one of the protesters screamed, get your hands off my God. And unless I'm mistaken, one of the commandments etched into the side of that narrative said something about graven images. And that was precisely Roger Williams' point. When church and state are conflated, it is the integrity of the faith that is compromised. So, I sometimes call the First Amendment America's best idea because it did separate church and state, and it has ensured a lively religious marketplace unmatched anywhere in the world. And so for people like faux historian David Barton, who's really um, kind of the, the uh, um, person most responsible for this mischief over this conversation, comes along and said, says that the founders never intended for church and state to be separate entities. Uh, he's absolutely wrong about that. Not only that, he's wrong about the effects of the First Amendment in American life. It is America's 
best idea. Part of the argument on part of the Christian nationalists is that the founders were Christians. And so people like David Barton have been trying to baptize uh, founders like Thomas Jefferson or uh, Benjamin Franklin into fundamentalist Christians or evangelicals of some sort or another. And if you look through the roster of the founders, with the possible exception of Benjamin Rush, who was a physician, and uh, John Witherspoon, the uh, Presbyterian minister who was president of the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University, none of the founders would be welcome as members of any of these churches that are advocating for Christian nationalism. They simply wouldn't fit. And so that argument founders as, as well. A third bit of evidence from the early part of the nation's history comes from the Treaty of Tripoli. Now, the Treaty of Tripoli was negotiated in the final years of uh, the final year of George Washington's administration. It was sent to Congress by John Adams, who, of course, was uh, Washington's successor as president. It was read before the entire U.S. Senate and approved unanimously by the U.S. Senate. And the Treaty of Tripoli reads, at least in part, as the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslims, and as the said states never have entered into any war or act of hostility against any Muslim nation, it is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious, religious opinions shall ever produce an interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. Now, let me read that first part again. As the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. That's a pretty important clause that needs to be refuted by anybody who is trying to argue that America is and always has been a Christian nation. Well, uh, beyond the First Amendment, beyond the founders themselves, beyond the Treaty of Tripoli, uh, the United States was founded on this principle of the separation of church and state, even though uh, people in recent years have been trying to countermand and counterargue that point. There have been various attempts throughout American history to make the United States into a so-called Christian nation. Uh, probably the best known in the 19th century was uh, the effort on part of a group called the National Reform Association. Uh, unfortunately, the letter's NRA, but it was at that time National Reform Association. And they drafted a, an amendment to the Constitution that would have declared the United States a Christian nation. Now, the historical context for that was the Civil War. One of the criticisms on the part of the Confederates against the Union was that the U.S. Constitution does not mention God, does not talk about uh, Christianity or America being a Christian nation. And so the Confederacy uh, rather uh, blatantly included that language in their constitution. And in response, uh, some Union folks, uh, a group of Protestant ministers, for the most part, came up with this so-called Christian amendment to the constitution. They took it to, to Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln uh, wisely temporized, said something to the effect, uh, the act of amending the constitution should not be undertaken lightly. And he knew better that uh, America should not be designated as a Christian nation. Well, these attempts have recurred at various times. I don't have time to get into every iteration of this, but uh, as late as the 1960s, in response to the school prayer rulings by the Supreme Court, there have been efforts in Congress to amend the Constitution to declare that the United States is a Christian nation. Unfortunately, they have been turned back by uh, cooler heads at that moment. Well, why is it that this is such a, an important issue these days? Why is it that so many white Christians, and I will make that point along with uh, Dr. Dr. Chisby, are trying to, uh, in effect, baptize the United States as a Christian nation? Uh, I think one 
issue, and and again, Dr. Tisby alluded to this, and I think he's absolutely, he's absolutely right about this. One motivation is nostalgia, nostalgia for a simpler time, uh, a, a, a more orderly society. And especially in the early years of the religious right, there was a lot of pining for the 1950s. Uh, people talked about the various television programs, Father Knows Best and uh, Ozzy and Harriet and uh, Leave it to Beaver and that sort of things. These were uh, programs in the 1950s going into the early part of the 1960s. <laughs> and I think nostalgia is a very powerful uh, motivation motivator for a lot of these folks. Um, the Andy Griffith Show, uh, Mount Airy, North Carolina, gets thousands and thousands of visitors every year uh, because it's the uh, birthplace of Andy Griffith himself, and it's, it purports to be the inspiration for the Andy Griffith Show, uh, Mayberry in the in the television program and uh, ted koppel did a, um, a cbs sunday morning uh, story on this uh, a couple of years ago interviewing people who were coming to mount airy north carolina and it was very clear they were uh, kind of pining for this earlier more peaceful halcyon time in the 1950s and early 1960s well fine i may understand that i suppose but let's remember that people of color were not participating in this sort of bounty of post-war America. They were not flocking to the suburbs, as were white Americans. And even within families themselves, uh, the, the women were not allowed full expression in the, in the, in the marketplace or, or the workplace. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of uh, secrets, uh, people's sexual identities uh, going undercover during the 1950s. So it may not have been quite the halcyon age that we imagine. But nevertheless, there's the, 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 the lure of sentimentality and nostalgia, I think, is very strong. And part of the, the argument is that America used to be more Christian or maybe was a Christian nation in the sense that Christians held a kind of hegemonic hold on American society. Now, that's a debatable point, whether they do or not today. I think they probably do, probably more than they don't. But one of the changes that took place that I think has contributed to this sentiment about Christian nationalism is the Immigration Act of 1965, the so-called Hart Seller Act that removed the immigration quotas that were established by the Reed Johnson Act of 1924. And ever since then, uh, you've had uh, an influx of immigrants, many from Asia and Southeast Asia, who have literally reshaped the religious landscape in America. And I think a lot of Americans, a lot of Christian Americans, uh, evangelicals, particularly white evangelicals, began to say, wait a minute, uh, this is no longer the place that we thought it was. We now have to compete in this marketplace of religion, whereas in the past uh, we didn't. We could assume that we were uh, had some kind of hegemonic hold on American society. And they didn't like that. And I think Christian America or the Christian nationalism is in many ways a way to kind of uh, reclaim what America looked like, or at least they thought it looked like before 1965 and all of these uh, the influx of all of these immigrants. The other thing that we need to consider is what happens to this movement in the 1970s. I've spent far too much time <laughs> researching this, and I've come to dispel what I call the abortion myth. The abortion myth is the fiction that the religious right galvanized as a political movement in the 1970s in direct response to the Roe v. Wade decision of January 22nd, 1973. I have all sorts of evidence here. I'm not going to get into all of it, but I'll give you just a, a few uh, tidbits. In 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is not exactly known as a redoubt of liberalism, passed a resolution at their meeting in St. Louis calling for the legalization of abortion a resolution they reaffirmed in 1974, that's a year after Roe v. Wade, and again in 1976. When the ruling was headed, handed down, most evangelicals were silent on the matter. 
But those who commented, such as W.A. Criswell, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, actually applauded the Roe v. Wade decision as marking an appropriate boundary between personal morality and public policy. Jerry Falwell, by his own admission, did not preach his first anti-abortion sermon until February 26, 1978. That's more than five years after the Roe v. Wade decision. Evangelicals considered abortion a Catholic issue throughout the 1970s, and it was only in the late 1970s, in advance of the 1980 presidential election, that they attached themselves to the abortion issue. It was not an issue before that. That raises the question, if the abortion myth is the fiction about the founding or the mobilization of white evangelical voters in the 1970s, what was the real catalyst? And again, as Nathan suggested earlier, the real catalyst was a court decision. Uh, again, I'm happy to go into all these details later, but it was a court decision, a district court for the District of Columbia in 1971 that ruled that any organization that engaged in racial segregation was not by definition a charitable organization and thereby should have no claims on tax exempt status. That got the attention of Jerry Falwell, who had started his own segregation academy in Lynchburg, Virginia in 1967, and also Bob Jones University, which for decades had been boasting that they did not admit students of color into the student body. That was the catalyst for the religious right, it had nothing whatsoever to do with abortion. And by the way, um, among my evidence in that uh, is the, the leaders of the religious right themselves, particularly Paul Weyrich, who was utterly emphatic about this, that abortion was not the catalyst for the rise of the religious right. Uh, my time is up here, but let me just kind of link this race issue to the present. You know, the question is, how did we get from the origins of the religious right in defense of racial segregation, to put it plainly? Uh, you know, we, we can nuance that a little bit, but that's what we're talking about to 81% of white evangelicals supporting Donald Trump in 2016, a greater percentage in 2020, and who knows what we're looking at for 2024. I think the bridge figure here is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan entered politics in California in opposition to the Rumford Fair Housing Act, which sought to engage sought to ensure equal access to housing, both for purchase and for rental. He was an outspoken opponent of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Throughout his political career, his campaign was littered with so-called dog whistles, uh, talking about law and order, uh, criticizing so-called welfare queens, supposedly women of color who lived luxurious lives lives off of the, pu the public dole. He was never able to produce one of these welfare queens, but he sounded sure that they existed. And for me, the clincher was the 1980 campaign. On August 3rd, 1980, Ronald Reagan elected to inaugurate his general election campaign for the presidency in, of all places, Philadelphia, Mississippi, at the Neshoba County Fair. This is the place where 16 summers earlier, members of the Ku Klux Klan, in collusion with the local sheriff's department, abducted, tortured, and murdered three civil rights workers. Reagan was the master of symbolism and lest anyone in that all-white audience miss his meaning, he echoed the age-old segregationist battle cry, I believe in states' rights. As president, he eviscerated the Civil Rights Commission. Uh, he also stood with apartheid South Africa to the end. And so I think 
when you look for a link between the origins of the religious right in defense of racial segregation and Donald Trump in 2016, I think you have to account for Ronald Reagan as being the bridge figure in that narrative. I think I'll leave it there. I've probably gone beyond my allotted time. Uh, thank you for your attention. Bridge figure is a phrase I never would have thought to apply to Ronald Reagan, but in this context, it makes sense. <laughs> and that's it's a piece of the history I didn't I didn't know. Thank you so much, Dr. Bomber. Uh, I'm going to invite our panelists to we will take 15 to 30 minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to say about the Q&A, there are so many fantastic questions in that box about every aspect of Christian nationalism. And we're not, unfortunately, not going to have time to get to all of them. I wish we did. We're going to focus on the questions that are about race, the, particularly the white and white Christian nationalism, because that's our theme for Lent. Lent is a penitential season. We, Those of us who are white are certainly all complicit in white supremacy and racism to varying degrees. And this is a season to tackle that uh, as a way of our confessions and repentance. So we're going to focus on the questions about race tonight. But first, I'd like to ask our panelists to kick off the questions. Jamar, do you have a question for Randall? I'll jump right to the hot topic, although there were several you brought up, Dr. Balmer. Um, going back to the origins of what we now call the religious right, and you've really done incredible scholarship to upend the narrative that it was the issue of abortion that really coalesced these. Uh, but could you talk more about why it wasn't the segregation issue that that became the banner uh, that became what is well known, and it be, and, and it was abortion that became the thing that the religious right was known for. Sure, that's a great question. I, I think uh, I I sometimes refer to Paul Weirich as the the evil genius. <laughs> Paul Weirich was really the architect of the religious right, working behind the scenes to try to mobilize these voters. And by the way, uh, he told me in a conversation I had with him in November of 1990, he said, I've been trying since the Goldwater campaign to get these people, meaning evangelicals, vote registered and, and voting because he was confident he could marshal them behind conservative uh, causes. He said, I tried everything. I said, I tried the school prayer issue. I tried the abortion issue. I tried the pornography issue. I tried uh, women's uh, rights issue. Nothing got their attention until the IRS started coming after Bob Jones University and segregation academy. So he was even absolutely emphatic about that. So that he was very clear about that. And again, my research, uh, um, confirms that, that it was the the attempt to to um, uh, rescind the tax exemption of segregated institutions. But he was also cagey enough, as I said, he's the evil genius here, to recognize that if he wanted to mobilize massive amounts of white evangelical voters, he needed an issue other than racial segregation. This is, of course, by the late 1970s. So he, he understood that. And what happened was, and, and this is just really kind of odd in many ways, is that in the 1978 midterm elections, he resolved to go out and elect some rather improbable people. And so he focuses on New Hampshire when Thomas McIntyre, a Democrat, is running for re-election. In Iowa, when Dick Clark, not that Dick Clark, but Dick Clark, the senator, was running for re-election, Democrat, and two Senate races in Minnesota. One of them was for the unexpired term of uh, Hubert Humphrey. And in all four of those races, the final weekend of that campaign, pro-lifers, Roman Catholics, leafleted church parking lots. And two days later, in an election with a very low turnout, as tends to be the case in midterm elections, all four favored Democratic nominees lost to anti-abortion Republicans. Now, I remember reading through Weirich's correspondence, which is improbably enough at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, um, and, and looking at his correspondence surrounding that 1978 midterm election, and you can, it, it, it's like the papers start to sizzle <laughs> because he realized he's finally found the issue that is going to work for him. Wow. And so that's how abortion becomes part of the, of the um, political agenda of the religious right. 
So he had this test case in this election. He was yeah, like, whoa, it worked. Yeah. Now it we works. can expand it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And, and then what the follow-up on that was the um, a film series called Whatever Happened to the Human Race uh, oh. by uh, that featured Francis Schaeffer and C. Everett Koop, uh, arguing that any society that countenances abortion will very soon thereafter also legalize euthanasia and infanticide and so forth. And that's what, what gets the ball rolling. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Now let's turn the tables. Dr. Bomber, what's your question? For sure. Dr. Well, there's a lot we can talk about. And thank you again, Dr. Tisby, for uh, the, the wonderful uh, narrative here. Uh, I, I was really taken by your description of about the plantation mentality and the notion of a slave society being an ordered society. And in my remarks, I talked about the, the power of nostalgia. Do you think the two of those go together in any way? Exactly. That's exactly what I was uh, thinking when you were talking about nostalgia. I think that is a, a perfect word for this. There's this romanticized memory of the way things used to be. And the way things used to be were peaceful. The way things used to be were predictable. And all that got messed up and jumbled up when you have these quote unquote minorities demanding their rights, right? Yeah. And so I don't, I wanna, I wanna be very careful here because first of all, white Christian nationalism exists as a spectrum. So sociologists tell us it's not a light switch. You either are or you aren't. You're either on or you're off. It's it's more of a spectrum of, of how tightly you hold these beliefs. And so there are ambassadors who are the about 10% of, of the population, and they're the, the flag-waving. They're the ones who would show up at January 6th. But there is this other group called the accommodators, hmm. which are sort of curious maybe even skeptical, but they would check a lot of the same boxes. So I say that because I want to make sure that we're not sort of falsely conflating anyone who holds these ideas with the most extreme manifestation of them. So that's why it's, I carefully bring up things like plantation economy and slavery, carefully think, bring up things like the Ku Klux Klan. I'm not saying all white Christian nationalists would agree with those things, but I am saying there's a, a, a family resemblance because... Mm -hmm. So much of what um, Southerners, uh, Confederates, I should say, and and even post Civil War, were longing for. This is partly what the Lost Cause is about. Were those nostalgic days gone by? Yeah, gone and, with the wind. <laughs> and exactly, gone with the wind. And deeply embedded in that, we can see this illustrated in Gone with the Wind. Was this plantation social structure where you had a strong, wealthy white man who called the shots you had his white wife who was you know the 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 woman on the pedestal uh to be nurtured and protected at all costs especially against the black men and then you had his his own biological white children who he cared for but you also had enslaved people who were also treated as perpetual children now that sort of structure shifts after abolition, but that's essentially what Jim Crow was trying to reestablish. Um, and the redemption era were trying to reestablish white men in charge economically, politically, socially, and even ecclesiastically, and uh, protection of the white woman, um, and the subjugation and subordination of anyone who was not white, but especially black people. So all of this takes real study because they're not going to say that part out loud. They'll deny it and, in fact, strategically deploy people of color to deflect accusations of racism. But when you look at who's really still in charge, mm. who's really still pulling the strings, I think you see that those echoes of the plantation economy even today. Thank you both. Um... I'm going to ask a couple of questions and turn to the Q&A box. And Dr. Tisby, I'm really glad you ended on that note about the way that people of color are strategically deployed and used by white Christian nationalist leaders. Because that's it's a question I've asked you before when we met the first time. And now I want to ask you in this setting. Uh, 
faithful. Um, so white Christian nationalism reminds me of the Republican National Convention. Every four years, we see this lineup of speakers of color on our television. Uh, but then when the cameras turn around, it's a very, very white audience. And Christian nationalist events like Mike Flynn's Reawaken America Tour are the same darn thing. Faithful America has been protesting the Reawaken America Tour and getting Christian voices against it for two years. But they're really good at trotting out Pastor Mark Burns, Pastor Leon Benjamin, uh, and a host of other pastors and doctors of color. Uh, and so when we're in the news for 30 seconds, if we say it's white Christian nationalism or it's racism, they say, you're calling Mark Burns racist, he's black, and we lose. Like, we lose the soundbite war. Uh, if we give us two minutes instead of 30 seconds, it's a different conversation. But they're very effective at strategically deploying those voices. And I'm not about to go and call a person of color uh on the plantation. That's not appropriate for me to discuss, though I find what you're saying amazing and powerful. So for our mostly white audience, if you're at the Thanksgiving table talking about white Christian nationalism and your uncle says, you can't tell me that Lieutenant Governor Robinson in North Carolina is racist. He's black. You can't tell me that congressman from Florida who kicked out Kevin McCarthy is racist. He's black. And, and those are the leading voices of Christian nationalism. What do you, what, what do I as a white person or those in our, our largely white audience say to the white folks who have bought that hook, line, and sinker? That's a really important question. Um, basically, one, there, there are a few ways to, to talk about it. One, talking about white Christian nationalism as a set of ideas that anyone can ascribe to. So you don't have to be of a certain race or ethnicity to buy into these ideas. The question is, what is the fruit of them? Where does it lead? Who does it empower and who does it disempower? And if we look at the actual practices and policy positions of white Christian nationalists, not only does it disempower people of color, whether that's through voting or incarceration or um any number of the issues, immigration, anti-immigration views that they're talking about. Um, it also, not only does it disempower folks, it also is not representative of a majority of people of color. And I'll speak specifically about Black folks. So if you talk about these folks, you know, maybe it's a Tim Scott, maybe it's a Clarence Thomas, maybe it's a whoever you want to name, right? ask, is that representative of a majority of Black people? And if not, why not? That's the question. With all of these conversations, number one, we got to remember, it's not primarily a question of intellectual assent or logic, right? There's emotions, their identities, their feeling. So you can't really argue somebody down. But if you are in this conversation, I find it very helpful to turn the question back on them put the pressure on them to answer. They're asking you, what about Black people who are espousing these same ideas? I'm asking you, what about the vast majority of Black people who don't? Fantastic. Thank you. Um, that reminds me of a question I saw in the comments earlier, I mean, in the Q&A box earlier that asked what percentage of uh, Christian nationalists are people of color. And, and uh, I'll just briefly say, you've done some webinars with Robbie Jones from PRI. He has some great data on this that basically says two thirds of white evangelical Protestants subscribe to Christian nationalist notions. Less, It's about one third of other Protestants of color, which also includes Asian communities and, and such. But also those beliefs are much more strongly held, uh, more more adherence than, than uh so, so, so more supporters than um, I'm blanking on the different terms. I'm sorry, but they're much more strongly held among the white evangelicals, even than among the Protestants of color who hold them. Um, any, any, anything you've gathered from working with Robbie there to, to add? Yes, I'll state briefly from one of uh, the Public Religion Research Institute's reports. Uh, I'm quoting here. Um, there are nearly identical rates of Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism among these different racial groups. But a lot of times it is 
an issue um, of interpretation, uh, interpret interpreting the language, right? So there are a lot of um, theologically conservative Black Christians who, if you ask them, is America a Christian nation, might say yes, but they don't mean it in the same way mm -hmm. as many white Christian nationalists do. Um, and I often contrast uh, white Christian nationalism with black Christian patriotism. So these are two different ways of engaging faith and politics that will sound on paper pretty similar in terms of like, should the values, should Christian values be promoted? You know, questions like that. They'll both say yes, but here's the difference. White Christian nationalism leads to a narrowing of civil rights and democracy. Black Christian patriotism has led to an expansion of civil rights and democracy. So I would look at the fruit of, of what uh, they're proposing. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for spelling out the Public Religion Research Institute's name when I just use the acronym. Shame on me. Uh, I'm turn to you, Dr. Balmer. I'm going to share a question from the, the Q&A box. Reverend Adrian asked, some scholars suggest that the cultural and political power that mainline Protestants like you and I possessed in the mid to late 20th century actually inadvertently seeded much of today's Christian nationalism, uh, the, these largely white denominations, by merging Christian identity with state identity. Any thoughts to share on this notion? Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a legitimate point, and you could go back even further to the social gospel. Social gospel uh, engaged in this sort of confusion as well. I think uh, there's probably an argument to make to be made that the social gospel was pretty paternalistic. And I would, in in response to all this, I would come back to something I've said many times, and and probably um, maybe too many times. But my sense as a historian of religion in America is that the most effective prophetic religious movements always locate themselves on the margins of society and not in the councils of power. And once you begin to lust, and I'll use that verb advisedly, once you begin to lust after political power and political influence, you lose your prophetic voice. Now, I think the religious right is a great example of that. I think you can also make the point that mainline Protestantism in the post-war era up through the mid-1960s was guilty of that as well. Uh, it's always good to locate oneself at the margins. And I'm going to loop back, if I may, just quickly uh, to an earlier conversation that Dr. Tisby and I had. I'm going to quote from my book, if you don't mind my doing that. Uh, I mentioned Roy Moore earlier. Uh, the judge in, in Alabama, who, of course, ran for Senate uh, unsuccessfully a couple of years ago, at a campaign event, he was asked uh, when America was last great. He replied, I think it was great at a time when families were united. Even though we had slavery, they cared for one another. That's, <laughs> it's pretty much what you were just, saying. Just that little thing of, of race-based chattel slavery. But everything else was fine. <laughs> I, I'm I'm chuckling not because it's funny, but because it's sad. Uh, very sad. Um, I want to ask another question. Uh, well, primarily Dr. Tisby, but I think Dr. Bomber, you, you should answer this too. And, and uh, Dr. Tisby, I know you saw this in the Q&A section, but let's pull it into the, the conversation. Isn't fear a significant factor in the rise of white Christian nationalism, specifically fear that non-white people are likely to become a majority? What role do, do those racial fears play in driving this political movement? Writ large, fear is a major factor. Um, the psychologists will tell us that if you're trying to get people mobilized to do something, fear is a greater motivator than something like hope. And so th this is a marketing tactic on one hand, to, to get people involved, to get them to vote. If you don't do this, our country is going up in flames, right? Or our country is being invaded by immigrants, right? These are, this is deliberate language to stoke fear. And there's always a sense of aggrievement involved in this, that 
White Christian nationalists are the ones being persecuted. White Christian nationalists are the ones losing what's theirs to these outsiders or these people of color or whatever it may be, right? So fear is, is a massive part of that. And demographics are a big part of that because it's true. <laughs> the demographics are changing. The white people will no longer be a majority in this country in just the next couple of decades. And already, the youngest generations, it's a pluralism. Uh, you can't name one majority group. It's it's a it's a bunch of different folks. That is part of what's fueling um, this resurgence of the so-called replacement theory mm -hmm. and ideas that, you know, it, unless white families have a bunch of kids and unless we keep immigrants out of this country, by the way, certain immigrants, remember, the comment from the previous president of of <laughs> s hole countries and naming countries that that had brown and black skinned people and saying why can't we get more immigrants from like Sweden or something right like that all of that's part of it and so it's fueling this idea that uh, true Americans white Christians will be overwhelmed in numbers by people of color and those they consider non-American or, or un-American. Thank you. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Balmer? No, I think that uh, that, that was a, a beautiful answer. <laughs> well, before the next question, I want to acknowledge what a couple people have properly, correctly pointed out in the Q&A box, which is that this is what some might call a mantle. All three of us are men speaking tonight and and certainly there's powerful intersection between race and gender and and black women and trans people of color will be harmed even more and it's important to have women uh, we, on, on panels like this our next event all uh, our next webinar all of the the guests will be women as they were when we had a webinar on immigration in december it's sometimes hard when you have three speakers instead of four or five but that's really important to point out and and i'm grateful to those who are calling us out on it thank you uh, and, and we'll endeavor to have balance over the arc of our full Linton series. Um, I want to pull together a couple of the questions in the Q&A that are sort of asking the same thing. Several people have brought up Christian Zionism uh, and, and how white Christian nationalism can, can be anti-Semitic, how that plays into what we see in the Middle East. At the same time, others, and, and Christian Zionism is inherently anti-Semitic because it supports Israel for the wrong reasons to, to ultimately destroy Judaism. Uh, in, in the end times. Other people have asked about immigration and how Christian nationalists have turned against immigration to this country, despite it being so common in the Bible to support immigrants. Uh, all these different forms of hatred, and we just talked about gender, connect. Uh, that's maybe part of that permission structure. So can you talk about the ways that the white and white Christian nationalism ultimately harms everybody, creating more forms of hatred as it goes? I'll say a couple of quick things. Uh, first of all, yes, this is a mantle, and uh, that's not 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 great in 2024. We're conscious of it, and I know uh, Reverend Nathan's going to have representation across this entire series. I will say um, patriarchy is a big part of this. Misogyny is a big part of this in, in the way that white Christian nationalists see an ordered society, right? You have some of these folks saying a woman can't be president because that would put her in a leadership position, which reflects, you know, some Christian traditions that only have ordained men as clergy, right? Um, so all that's all part of it. I mean, if you you want to talk about race, you want to talk about class, you want to talk about gender, you want to talk about sexuality, all of it has a place in the hierarchy or in the order, and it's all subordinate to white men in power. I'm going to also say something that's going to be controversial, even to this probably mostly progressive crowd. As we see time and time again, where the way whiteness functions, white women can selectively deploy their whiteness to their advantage. Don't shoot the messenger. Mm -hmm. But this is why there has to be something called womanism, which is different from feminism, which is mostly white women feminist, feminism. Womanism is Black women who understand that race and gender intersect and have to be both addressed. 
So all of this has a racial component to it. That's on one part. To your question, um, Reverend Nathan, the simplest way I can put it is there is a picture or a collage of the ideal American. And you can name some figures from pop culture. John Wayne, like Jesus and John Wayne uh, by Kristen Dumay. Or I'm a Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe fan for most of it. Um, who is the quintessential American? Captain America. What does he look like? A white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired man. The representation of America. You can go back to Uncle Sam, right? So there's this picture, there's this vision, there's this ideal of a true American. And if you don't fit that, because you're a woman, because you're Black, because you speak a different language as your first language, then there's going to be a problem with white Christian nationalists, right? So all of that gets subsumed into this thing, and it all has a racial component. Thank you. And and uh, let me back up a minute to that point about the mantle, just to recommend a book, White Evangelical Racism, uh, The Politics of Morality in America by Dr. Anthea Butler. Let's get an important womanist voice in here uh, just for a second. So bring that up one more time. Please check out Dr. Butler's work. Uh, I'm going to throw a curveball and ask a totally different question to Dr. Balmer. Your newest book is called Passion Plays, How Religion <laughs> Shapes Sports in North America. And, and religion and sports have a complex relationship. There's uh, Coach Kennedy bringing prayer on the football sidelines to the Supreme Court. There's, you talk about the sacramental of football at Notre Dame. There are groups like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes in Colleges. But race is also really important in Absolutely. sports. Look at how Colin Kaepernick was treated uh, for, for taking a knee and all the memes that went out around that. Uh, we all know Jackie Robinson's story and being spit on. So I I'm wondering if you have seen race impact the relationship of religion in sports too. Uh, are, are the Tim Tebow's given a bigger pass than the athletes of color, as given how different white evangelical Christianity is from black church traditions to begin with? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for mentioning this. <laughs> and I was going to bring it up because it, uh, you know, one response for the so-called disaffected white male is to move into Christian nationalism. Another one, I believe, is to become passionate about team sports here in North America. And what I are, speculate in this book, and by the way, you're absolutely right about the double standard. Tim Tebow and Colin Kaepernick both kneeled, but the response was very different uh, between the two, uh, black and white. Uh, but one of the things I argue, argue in the book is that the white male passion for organized sports, for team sports over the last several decades, and anybody who's listened to sports radio will know what I'm talking about. It's just uh, uh, a devotion uh, unmatched by anything religion, uh, anything religion, religious in our society. But part of the reason for the attraction is that the world of sports offers an alternative universe. It's the closest thing we have in our society to the proverbial level playing field. That is to say, if you're not talented, you're not going to play. So it's the closest thing we have in our society to a perfect meritocracy. And one of the reasons that white males are so avid in their sports fandom is because the world of sports offers this alternative universe very much unlike their perception, and I want to emphasize perception, of the real world, where everyone else has an advantage, you know, whether it's women, people of color, uh, we're talking about uh, affirmative action and, and all these sorts of things. The perception is that the, the world is against them. And this sports fandom allows them to escape into another alternative universe where the fields are marked by right angles for the most part. Something is either fair or foul. It's either inbounds or out of bounds. You can't make all of these uh, sort of uh, appeals. You know, if you're, you're called uh, for strike three, you can't 
go back to the, turn back to the ump and say, gee, ump, I've had a bad day. Uh, you know, give me a break. Uh, it's this uh, orderly universe. I think that's part of the big appeal of it. But race plays a different role in this, uh, as you suggested by your question, in that you have these white fans cheering for athletes of color, for the most part, or at least largely, the irony is that they're cheering for people who make in a single season, probably more than many of these white fans will make of their entire lifetime. And they're okay with that. As long as the athletes of color stay in their lane, so to speak. Um, if you step out of it, as Colin Kaepernick did, you're going to be reviled. You're going to be kicked out of the game. Um, the great example several years ago, uh, Laura Ingram on Fox, talking to two basketball players, black basketball players, uh, LeBron James and uh, I forget who the other one was. Um, I should know, I'm sorry. And her advice to them was to shut up and dribble. That is, as long as they're in the, in the, in the athletic arena, they're fine. But if they begin to step out of that, as Colin Kaepernick did, as LeBron James did, then they are subject to criticism from uh, people who don't like to hear it from black athletes. So yes, uh, sports plays into this, I think in, in very fascinating ways. Thank you. Um, two final questions. One, we have to ask at, at all these webinars, um, everyone will always wanna know, it's an important question, what, what can I do? And specifically in a church context, uh, knowing that most of our members are a little older, most of us are white, but there is some diversity here. What can I do in my community? What can I do in my church to combat white Christian nationals? And we had a lot of people ask this in different ways. And I want to call special attention to the way two people asked it. Uh, one who was looking for advice for one of her upcoming sermons, addressing some local controversies and, and issues in bullying. And she specifically said, listening to Jamar, uh, to, to Dr. Tisby, I'm, I'm now concerned about trying to delineate between the white Christian nationalist vision and the rest of us who consider ourselves following Jesus's teachings of love and inclusion. Can you help me with this dilemma of how to properly delineate Jesus versus racism and nationalism in a way that gets heard? And of course, sometimes we know it's not the talking points that matter. There are other strategies and relationships. So both of you, what can we do? Uh as a historian, I'm sort of biased, and I think history helps us here. I think yes. there are um, figures from history who we can point to, especially Black Christians, who demonstrate another way and give us another witness. I'm drawn to uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, who's in the picture behind me, along with Ella Baker, two of our greatest uh, civil rights activists and freedom fighters. And Fannie Lou Hamer says, you know, um, she gave a, a testimony at the Democratic National Convention in 1964. She was arguing for um, a, 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 uh, a delegation from Mississippi that included Black people, which to this day is the state ha that has the highest proportion of Black people in the country, nearly 40% of the state's population, no Black delegates for decades and decades in the Jim Crow era, right? And so she gives this testimony, and I love her stirring words at the end. She says, is this America? And she's what she's doing is she's, she's, she's calling on the aspirations of the nation to be this multiracial, inclusive, equitable democracy. And she says, is this America where, where, where I have to take my phone off the hook so I don't hear the death threats all night. So contrasting examples like hers or even MLK or Coretta Scott King, or you can go further and further back, whoever you want, right? I think the, the, the uh, examples from history writ large, but especially by black Christians who are often uh, very religious and pushing for democracy, pushing for voting rights, pushing for equality, that's a different way of of thinking about it. I mean, even just sorry, I'll I'll be quiet after this. But even just um, in more contemporary times, uh, you probably won't bring this up because it'd be polarizing. But we see another example in Raphael Warnock, who literally is in the pulpit that Martin Luther King held, right, and is also a senator. Um, that looks very different from, let's say, a Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who is 
uh, the daughter of a, a Baptist minister, right? And now governor of Arkansas. So there, we do have all of these examples. I think bringing up the examples from history and saying, you know, what would they be about now? Or, or even just on a religious angle, what resembles Jesus? Who would Jesus be hanging out and advocating for? Will it work? I don't know. But you've presented your witness if you do that. Yeah, I like that. And I agree about the importance of history, not only for individuals, but also history itself. And, you know, what both of us were trying to do today was present some history so that people have that information to counteract bad history. And I think that's important. And you mentioned Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, I still am shaking my head at this. Uh, one of his, her her uh, campaign brochures that she mailed out before she was elected governor of Arkansas uh, appealed to her supporters to defend their God-given Second Amendment rights. <laughs> I mean, you think about that phrase, God-given. I somehow missed that in the book of Genesis. But nevertheless, uh, you know, counteracting that sort of nonsense, I think, is awfully important. But I think also... And this is hard for me, uh, to, frankly, even with my own family, uh, having conversations and and listening, listening to people with different political uh, views. It's very difficult. I, I find it uh, almost excruciating, but I think it's also important to do that. My deep thanks to you both. The last question, with so much racism happening in Jesus's name, with Donald Trump really putting it center in the country and threatening all our institutions, including the church, it could feel dire. What gives you hope? I think conversations like this give me hope. Uh, the fact that we've got, if, if I read correctly, a, a good number of folks who are tuning in and are paying attention to these sorts of discussions, I think is gives me hope. Uh, I also think that as a Christian and as a parent, I don't have the luxury of despair. I have to be hopeful. Uh, despair is uh, a cop-out, I think, in some ways. And we have to find reasons to be hopeful. And we have to work uh, to, 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 to actualize, to realize that hope. And I, 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 that in itself gives me hope. I, I, I'll, I'll add a theological gloss to this. Um, uh, the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, it strikes me that hope is the only one that's volitional. That mm. is to say, we can choose to be hopeful. Uh, we can't, especially if you're a Calvinist, you can't choose to be faithful. Uh, love is something that is uh, it defies uh, logic. Uh, but we can choose, we can elect to be hopeful. And I think that's important to do. I, I I really like that answer that we we don't have the luxury of despair. Um, I think that is absolutely true. Uh, I think of Matthew five in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Uh, for yours is the kingdom of God. Right. This is not something new that followers of of Jesus uh, should be well acquainted with. Not being in the center and not having all the power. And so it comes down to, do we believe what we say we believe? Do we believe that God is powerful, that God is on the side of righteousness and justice? And it doesn't mean we win every worldly battle, but it does mean we can always have hope. And then I'll also say, lastly, that the longer I'm in this work, uh, particularly of racial justice, the more I learn that the, the victory is in the process. The victory is in the journey. The victory is not simply in laws passed or policies changed. It's in how we ourselves are changed. And so what gives me hope is seeing people who are changed and transformed in simply the act of pursuing justice and doing the right thing and the kind of people we become when we are out, are about righteousness and justice and truth in the world. Lovely. Powerful. My deep, deep thanks to you both, Dr. Jamar Tisby and Dr. Randall Balmer for taking the time 
on a Monday night when there are so many other things, on a federal holiday when there are so many other things you, you could have been doing, a federal holiday that falls on the birthday of a president who did many good things but was also a slave owner. So very important for us perhaps to be marking today with this conversation. Uh, thank you both to everyone who, who watched. You're who give me hope. I mean, this was our second biggest webinar attendance ever uh, without the celebrity power of Rob Reiner. So I think that's that's uh, fantastic. Uh, to the 800 who tuned in, to the 600 who stuck it out to the end, thank you so much for being here. We'll send out an email the next day or two with a link to a recording where you can watch this video, as well as to all the books and things that we mentioned in the chat earlier this evening. And a reminder that part two of our Linton series, Giving Up White Supremacy, will be called Taking the Log from Our Own Eye. We're going to look at the way that our own progressive communities have created racism. And we're going to talk about the white supremacy within our own mainline Protestant and Catholic churches and what we can do about it. It's taken us far too long to take up this mantle. We're never going to take it up perfectly, but we're going to keep trying to do better every day in Christ. Uh, and so thank you for joining us this Lent. Uh, God loves you. Accept that love and spread it with justice. Once again, my deep thanks to our guests. Have a wonderful evening and God bless.